So thank you for joining us today. We're really excited to host our first conversation in partnership with the NSPCC as part of our year of childhood hosted by the Children's Parliament, which seeks to identify and promote best practice in a children's rights based approach. Today, we're going to be focusing on early childhood and discussing what kind of changes, tools and practices are needed to allow infants' voices to be meaningfully heard and understood in decision making, given the incorporation of the UNCRC into Scots law. We are delighted to be joined by Julia Donaldson, who is here to share her thoughts with us about this topic. Julia has a background as a clinical psychologist and is currently the clinical director of GIFT, the Glasgow Infant and Family Team. GIFT is a multidisciplinary infant and mental health team and Julia and her colleagues work with children aged between zero to five who are in kinship care and foster care. I'm Carmel Faulkner and I'm the Unfair Theatres Project Lead at Children's Parliament. My background is in education, specifically in early years, and I'm undertaking my PhD, which involves research with children aged three to six in an early childhood setting. So we know this is a mightily large question to answer in just 15 minutes. So we'll be continuing this conversation with Professor Kay Tisdale and planning one of our sector webinars later in the year to carry this discussion forward. So now I'd like to welcome our guest speaker, Julia. Julia, could you share your interests or your inspiration for joining us with this conversation? Yeah, thanks, Carmel. And I um, just want to say how delighted um, I was to be asked and to represent GIFT and NSPCC here today. Um, so as you've mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist by background and we currently work with young children and families who are in care. Um, and we work really intensively to see if, if parents can make changes to their relationships with the child to become safe parents. So I think the, the opportunity to have this discussion today really pulls through on my long-standing interest of, of working therapeutically with families who are experiencing adversity, particularly where they have young children. Um, but alongside that, really, really thinking about how we do represent what is in the child's best interest. And within that, thinking about young children's voices and how we can understand as best we can um, what young children are telling us about their needs and wants. So Julia, today our focus is on infants, which is the period of childhood that you're particularly passionate about, I think. Um, recently in our work with Children's Parliament, we've noticed that there's an increase um, in questions and some concerns about the implications that incorporation has on those working with babies and infants in particular. Um, so one of the questions that we, we've been thinking about is, when we consider children that move through systems such as child protection or care services, what do you think are the essential requirements to ensure the system, the organisations or practitioners can meaningfully listen to and also understand the views of infants and young babies? Yeah, I think it's such, it's such a helpful question to consider. And there's, there's a few things that come to mind. The first thing that comes to mind is about um, the culture that we have and that influences how we consider a child's voice. It's also so relevant is how do we communicate to young children? And what we find with working with young children in, in the care system, who are in foster care or kinship care, is that um, often people working to support them will will not will think that children don't understand. They don't understand what's happening to them. So, so words aren't used to explain young children's experiences. And I think the more that we can talk with even pre-verbal little babies about what is happening to them, both day to day, but also in terms of the bigger picture about who are they going to be living with? Why are they in care? The more we can talk about these things, the more young children can find their voice um, and communicate communicate their needs um, whether verbally or more likely for very young young children not verbally so one of the things that, that we do is we often talk about um, a narrative or a story for young children to explain for example and um, you know when you were very little mummy and daddy had grown-up problems that meant that they couldn't keep you safe and you went to live with 
so and so and then you know naming feelings and what that might have been like and um, so starting to think about that it can be really quite hard for people to think how do you put things into words that are okay for very young children and um, so that would be a sort of scene setting um, I think that's important is that we we learn um, culturally and as uh, people who are trying to support families to to help speak more about about these kind of issues um, Another thing that it touches on when we think about within the care system and thinking about the infant's voice is, is trying to listen very carefully for um, where there might be real problems. So, for example, we see some, some young babies and children who might not seek comfort um, from their caregivers in a way that means they're going to get their needs met. And... For us, that is really a psychological emergency because if a young child is not able to show that they need care from adults, which of course all young children do, um, then that is a crisis for their mental health development. But again, we're not, it's not always easy to, to know what are, what are the signs that something is really not going well for a young child. So that, that would be a, an example. So trying to listen into to what young children are telling us. So an, another idea I had about this is when we all know that young babies and young children are so dependent on their key relationships for all aspects of their development is so it's so key to them. So when we're thinking about understanding a young child's voice and what they might be telling us or showing us, um, it's really important to do that in the context of their key relationships. Mm -hmm. So that might mean for a young child in care, that might mean thinking about how does the how does the baby or child look in contact with their parents? How are they um, communicating their needs? If a, if their mum approaches them, for example, do um, do they join in with play? Do they make eye contact? Or if if their mum approaches them, do they put their head down and, and look away? And um, what might these kind of behaviours be telling us about what what the needs mm -hmm. the are in that relationship and how? how they feel they can get their needs met in the relationship. Um, so relationships are so key and it's, it's really key that while a young child's in care that their primary attachment figure or caregiver is their foster or kinship parents. And so it's really important to think about how they're communicating there as well. And that might be where they feel, they feel more safe, most safe to be able to show some of their, their needs. And if they are verbal for older, um, older wee ones, um, if they're verbal, they may be able to, um, to put some of that in, into words. We've worked with some young children, for example, will say very clearly, I don't want to see mummy and daddy. Um, and of course, we need to think about what that means um, mm -hmm. and what else is going on, going on that might, might be influencing that. Um, so those are some ideas. And I can say a little bit more about, about that. Um, just now, if you like, just a little bit more about um, some of the ways that young children communicate um, and things that come to mind are um, obviously as I was saying young children who are pre-verbal and um, they're going to show us um, their needs and wants which would give us an, an insight into their voice um, through behaviours and interactions mm -hmm. and if we watch very carefully and look for patterns over time we can cautiously infer what their voice and feelings are then but I think um, what's some you know part of the question I think is about you know what can we do and what what tools do we do we need so in order to to be able to meet that it's important that um, workers have knowledge of child development and how children communicate and also the impact of um, maltreatment, abuse and neglect, for example, can have on relationships with, with caregivers and parents so that, that um, a child could, for example, look okay because they've learned to be very pleasing to keep themselves safe. Um, but you might need to think underneath what, what might be really going on, might we expect this child to be feeling quite stressed here. So, so it, it, there's, a, there's a training need, I think, for um, for staff and also a resource need for, for the time to be able to um, spend with a young child and in the context of their different relationships to really to really get in and about and understanding what their voice might be. That's wonderful. It's um, everything you said is just really interesting and you can see the holistic 
um, view that we need to have with, with young infants. When I was thinking about the challenges and tools that we need moving forward, um, I also thought about what you were talking about, and I think that's the use of observation, um, which is widely used in research, isn't it, and in early childhood contexts when we're trying to listen and understand the views of young children. Um, and as you said, that needs careful interpretation. So observation is often criticised for being perhaps subjective. Um, but I really believe that whenever we listen to other people, it's a subjective act, I guess. Um, and we always have to be conscious about how we interpret even other adults that we're listening to, um, because our own biases and subjectivities really influence our interpretations. Um, but I definitely agree with you. What you're describing is observation so critical, isn't it, to understanding the views of babies and infants. And I think as long as we acknowledge those um, biases and subjectivities, we can make it, it meaningful. And another thing that you touched upon is um, ensuring that the principle of the UNCRC, um, so the keeping the child's best interest as a primary concern um, in decision making is really important. And I wonder if combining those two things, the observations and interpretations with children's best interests is a really good strategy to inform decision making. Yeah, yeah, I, I, um, I think that's a really, a really important point because, of course, you know, I think this probably will touch on a, another question that you, you're going to discuss with Kay, but, you know, thinking, thinking about how, you know, young children's capacity and their ability to represent their voices, um, it's, it's so important to be thinking about best interests but of course, very young children cannot make, they don't have the capacity to make informed decisions about what is their best interest, mm -hmm. but listening to their voices um, and trying to understand um, carefully and cautiously through observations and understanding about the wider picture of what's been, what has happened to them um, can, can really allow others to do their very best to, um, to understand what, what the, the young child's voice is. Ginny, you mentioned um, training as a need. Is there anything um, in particular, you know, a specific tool or a specific practice that you think is needed within the system to ensure infants' voices are meaningfully heard and inform that decision making? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. And, and my answer is really that there's, there's probably a few different tools and I imagine different professionals would give you different um, different ideas about that from different backgrounds. It's probably quite good to pull in, um, you know, pull in a range of ideas about that. But I mean, there are, um, for example, with very young babies who are under two, there's um, Brazelton's N Baths um, approach, which really looks in great detail about behaviours around about for the, that, that show that a child's comfortable or show that they're not they're not comfortable. But um, there's you know, we use within our service, for example, a, a, a very structured and standardised play observation or the still face procedure to, to understand um, what's happening in, in the relationships and how, how a wee infant is able to communicate their, their needs and wants within that. Um, so those kind of approaches are helpful. But I think one of the basic underlying fundamentals of thinking about training is, is about just as you're saying to be really aware of um, any biases that we might bring in and trying to be really as objective as possible. So first of all, um, to practice seeing, seeing what you see in the observation before mm -hmm. then interpreting it. To, so to really have a sense of what is the behaviour or the interaction that you're seeing and then carefully think, okay, what, what might be the meaning of that um, underneath so um, I imagine that's that's one that we might have um, further ongoing discussion about and I don't know if you might be aware Carmel of any um, any approaches that might be be helpful as well in observation. I, um, I've used various um, approaches mostly in early childhood settings so probably more pedagogically based in um, around I guess more mental health um, or or um, specific issues I guess but uh, I just find that whatever observation tools used it's like you say it's really important to understand our own positioning when we're trying to interpret those observations um, 
and a team approach I think to any observation tool that we're using to get different perspectives is really helpful to again make sure there isn't a dominant um, perspective that that takes over something and maybe misinterprets what we're we're trying to understand that the children are communicating mm -hmm. that's really really helpful um, we have um, one final question I think for you which is very much focused on your particular area of expertise so um, there's been a growth in research about connections between upholding children's human rights and improving um, children's well-being and I wondered if framing conversations about infant mental health in the language of rights could be quite a powerful change but I wondered what your thoughts were about how we talk about um, infants mental health yeah, thank you. I, I think it does give us an opportunity to think um, a little bit differently about infant mental health and um, to do it through that, through the rights lens, um, as of course, because positive mental health is something um, that is a, a right for, for all children and it's very much in, in endorsed, isn't it, in the UNR? CR um, in terms of um, thinking about rights for best interest, healthy development, which includes healthy emotional development as well as physical development and recovery from trauma and abuse, for example, are, are all, all in there in terms of children's rights. So I, I think there's there's a real strength in there because um, infant mental health in many ways is a relatively new way of speaking about young children's emotional well-being. Um, and it's it's probably you know garnered force over the, the past decade. But for I think what's so important for all of us, regardless of where we're working with young children, is to be able to speak in a, a common language that's understandable. And um, so I mean, with you working, you know, in the, within the early years frame, Carmel, I'm sure um, you will be doing and considering so much that is about an impact on child well-being and, and mental health. Um, so um, I guess another thing about thinking about mental health probably is in, broadens out from thinking about mental health in, in general. And I think the stigma is being reduced gradually over time about mental health more broadly. Um, but Certainly in, in my work, I take a very broad view of mental health. So not we're not just thinking about mental health problems, we're thinking about positive mental health and how we can promote resilience and um, recovery where there has been adversity. Um, but obviously for very little ones, um, it's not just about their mental health in the here and now and doing everything that we can. It's about stacking up things and laying the foundations for um, for more positive mental health throughout the, li the lifespan. So um, I think the the rights um, the rights lens can can really help us with that in a in a healthy start way. Um, it, it leads me on to, to think a wee bit about how do we help people understand about the importance of relationships for um, for infant mental health as well. As we talked about earlier, I think I think as a society we have a good understanding that of course young children are so dependent and they really need their caregivers um, to help them. But um, I think what's what with when you're thinking about mental health is that it's it's through that relationship um, with a, a primary caregiver that so much is being formed and developed for young children. And um, I'd be interesting to, to hear your thoughts about this, but one of the things that comes to mind, you know, when we look at the outcomes for very young children and in, in terms of key areas of mental health, like thinking about self-esteem and emotional well-being and um, how they get on socially with other children, um, the the research indicates that the, the biggest predictor of, of those kind of healthy outcomes in those kind of areas is um, from their their primary caregiving relationship. And of course, education is, is very important, but as the, the kind of more fundamentals of, of um, and indicators about that. And I think if there's more understanding of, of that, it leads us into more thinking about 
So how can we as, as a country take responsibility to really help as much as possible um, all young children get the best start they have? And that means thinking very much about their, their parents um, and their caregivers as well. Um, and it's such an exciting time in terms of there's so many developments happening um, through the Scottish Government just now um, in terms of early years developments, but also in terms of perinatal and infant mental health services that are developing um, as we speak across the country. So there's there's more, more of that recognition um, about in there. And I'd be really keen to hear from you about some of your thoughts, because of course, thinking about universal services like education and health visiting, um, you know, that they are more important than people like me sitting in an infant mental health team, because they're, you know, you're working and, and relating to so many children, having the opportunity to, to make change with so many, um, so many children, whereas, for certainly in the service I work with, obviously we're we're working with um, with families who've been dealing with great adversity across generations, mm -hmm. um, that's impacting on their parenting and their ability to keep the wee ones safe, and and therefore impacting on their their child's mental health. Um, but I hope that there's recognition that this is a societal responsibility rather than a parent's responsibility individually just because that can easily take us into a blaming kind mm -hmm. of situation of, of parents which I think is really unhelpful. Yeah I think um, I think you're right this is a really exciting time for Scotland and it it kind of helps us wrap up the conversation in a sense um, because I think you started with talking about culture um, and then ended on relationships and both of those were threaded through the, the conversation and I think I agree I think and I think Children's Parliament agree that a rights-based approach approach is really um, underpinned by the relationships that we have with children whether that's with their primary caregiver whether whether it's in a nursery setting or a school setting or a friendship group that rights um, based relationships are really at the heart of supporting children's positive mental health and well-being and I think again I agree with you there's more research and interest in children's well-being and it's it cuts across all sectors doesn't it it fits in with um organizations like your own where um there's extremities and, and children are dealing with you know difficult issues but actually every child deserves positive mental health um and I think as a it's a collective, and, and I agree with you, it's cultural, that we need to make it cultural, that positive relationships are really key for, for young children in, in their, you know, holistic development. Um, so, yeah, that was really, really helpful. You've touched on so many different points from culture to relationships, the responsibilities of parents. And again, I feel in full agreement with you that the steps to incorporate the UNCRC means that um, we also recognise that actually parents do have responsibility for children, but they also deserve support and um, help from governments as well to ensure that they can provide what children need. So I think that's, that's really helpful and a really positive move for, for Scotland and, and the culture of the whole community. Um, Julie, that was wonderful. This was just initial conversation around early childhood and very, very young children, um, infants and babies in particular. We've had a lot of interest about how we do listen meaningfully to young children and babies. And I think you've really helped us understand that. Um, it's very holistic, isn't it? It's a holistic approach we need to take. And, and it takes lots of relationship building it takes observation looking at children noticing how they're feeling how they're behaving um, it's quite complex it's not an easy task but I do think it's pos possible and I think you've put a really perspective um, positive perspective on it so I hope this conversation is useful to all those um, people across different sectors that are working with young children um, so finally I just want to say thank you very much for joining us today, Julia, and, and helping us kickstart our conversations about young children, infants and babies. Thanks so much, Carmel. Um, it's been really good to be part of it and look forward to the ongoing discussion. That would be great. I look forward to it too. Thanks, Julia.